This is probably incredibly overdramatic to say, but to my mind, the ending to The Snowman is one of the most devastating in all of fiction. There's no twist, no sudden stroke of misfortune. In fact, it's completely natural, and that's what makes it so heartbreaking. Based on the picture book by artist Raymond Briggs, The Snowman remains one of the most popular Christmas films in British culture, broadcast consistently every year since 1984, having first appeared on Boxing Day 1982 on Channel 4. Over the course of the film we see a young boy, James, build a snowman amid the heaviest snow for several years. At the stroke of midnight, the snowman comes to life and proceeds to take James on an adventure to the North Pole. After he's been dropped home and said goodbye, James wakes to find his friend has melted. Despite its popularity and integration into Christmas tradition, with the titular snowman having since become an icon of seasonal merchandise, the story itself is remarkably unfestive. For a start, the majority of the action takes place outside the familiar setting of a family home at Christmas time. Though directors Diane Jackson and Jim Murakami include a scene where James and the snowman join a party of other snowmen to meet Father Christmas, in Briggs's original book, there's nothing to actually say that it's set at Christmas. It's also worth pointing out that despite its place as a staple of family viewing at Christmas, having a young child as the protagonist, Raymond Briggs, as the creator of many books marketed at young readers, was not interested in this demographic. Well, I had no interest in children and um, didn't want to have any. But then I realised this is wonderful stuff. Meat and drink to the illustrator, really. <laughs> Possibly the film's most endearing quality is its complete wordlessness. Going beyond the form of a typical silent film, making use of intertitles to convey unheard dialogue, The Snowman depends entirely on its visuals, consisting of hand-drawn animation which closely emulates the style of Briggs' illustrations, and the extended score by composer Howard Blake. There's never an attempt to impose rationality on what we're seeing. The adult world is asleep for most of the story allowing this fantasy to unfold without interruption or description. There's a couple of different introductions to the film, the most famous probably being the one from the 1984 re-release, in which David Bowie, playing a grown-up James, recalls the story as a nostalgic anecdote. One winter I met a really big snowman. He got this scarf for me. You see, he was a real snowman. The original introduction, however, is far less glamorous with Briggs himself walking across a fallow field, recalling his real-life memory that inspired the book. I remember that winter because it brought the heaviest snow that I had ever seen. Snow had fallen steadily all night long, and in the morning I awoke in a room filled with light and silence. The whole world seemed to be held in a dreamlike stillness. It was a magical day, and it was on that day I made the snowman. This framing, with a transition from live-action footage to hand-drawn animation, adulthood to childhood memory, allows us to suspend our disbelief when the snowman comes to life, but it also creates a clear division between the grey stillness of maturity and the colourful fairy tale aesthetic of childhood. There's something deeply melancholic about the way Briggs introduces the tale. It hints at the loss that, really, we should be expecting, but it also carries the weight of more resonant aspects of his own life. Between 1972 and 1973, Briggs suffered three great losses in his life. Firstly, his wife of 10 years, Jean, who had suffered from schizophrenia, and then, within eight months of each other, his parents, Ethel and Ernest. In the following years, he would consider suicide. It's a pretty yeah, it was a pretty, period. Yeah, it was rather dreadful. Sort of doing myself in a few times, but um, one battled on courageously. Instead, he focused his efforts into making four books marketed for children, the first being Fungus the Bogeyman, a couple of books centred around a begrudging Father Christmas, and The Snowman. While the first three seem like distractions from this dire state of mind, in his subsequent work, starting with The Snowman, the spectre of mortality looms large. The year The Snowman was first broadcast, he published the graphic novel When the Wind Blows, in the same visual style as the rest of his books even revisiting characters from his book Gentleman Jim, but depicts the immediate consequences of a nuclear attack. It ends exactly as you'd expect. Mr. and Mrs. Bloggs, who survived the initial blast, begin to suffer radiation sickness and eventually crawl up and die. For Briggs, this isn't pessimism, it's just realism. Death is not an alien presence in Christmas fiction. 
Winter festivities arose in part as a way of banishing the dark and the cold at a time when nature is in decline, with the winter solstice marking the turning point when the day is at its shortest, right before things start to warm up again. This period of transition offers us a chance to reflect on the transience of things. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol is a perfect example of both the traditional ghost story and the story of renewal, as Scrooge faces his past, his future death, and learns how to live a better life. The snowman's mortality of a kind is a near constant presence throughout the story. As James takes him around the house, the warmth of the home at Christmas, as inviting as it looks, is naturally a threat. The film's score also instills a kind of dread or melancholia in us, with the main theme, expanded into the choral song Walking in the Air, being in the minor key. Infinite, infinitely poignant, merely because it is the minor six. That is just a phenomenon, a natural phenomenon of music. The film's edition of a kind of snowman convention brings to mind a different tradition, the danse macabre, or dance of death. Originating in the late Middle Ages, this genre, which has taken the form of poems, works of art, and famously a piece of music by Saint-Saëns, sees a representation of death lead various members of the living to the grave in a kind of pageant playfully reminding them of their own mortality. Now, this is not to say that the film is a conscious rejigging of this tradition. Mainly, this episode is inserted to create more of a link to the festival, giving an excuse for Father Christmas to appear. But the way the snowman seems intent on whisking James away has always to me suggested a kind of purpose or lesson behind the adventure. And while he chose him the magic of Christmas, a phrase that always seems a bit hollow to me, the key message of the story is, of course, that everything ends. In the four decades that the film has been on our screens, never has it been deemed too depressing to watch. Children start questioning death at as early as age three, and the snowman provides them with a simple, digestible portrait of grief. And because the film is totally wordless, the emotional resonance of the ending can be as grand or as minuscule as you want. The loss Briggs suffered was too awful and too sort of vague to ever pin down. So he alludes to it in pictures, the film continues to emotionally affect viewers of all ages precisely because, in its wordlessness, it captures a universal sense of loss, from the death of a loved one to the melting of a snowman. But this loss isn't final, of course. James can build another snowman, and he does, every year when we watch the film at Christmas. <laughs> 